So today we are going to look at the Rayleigh plateau instability in terms of the pi theorem. Before looking at the Navier-Stokes equation, we want to have a more clear understanding or a clearer understanding of the pi theorem, which provides us with a topic of dimensional analysis. So let's see what affects our pi theorem here, or what affects our instability. In the terms of a falling jet, our Rayleigh plateau instability, we have two important factors. Number one is the growth rate of the perturbations, and number two is our length scale of instability growth. So by perturbations, we mean the things, the stuff that characterizes our disturbances or the main cause of the instability. So because we have these tiny sources of disturbance, tiny sources that disturb, perturb, or annoy the system, this jet will eventually break up and become unstable. And these perturbations or disturbances can be expressed by a set of sinusoids or sine functions that have a certain value of omega and a certain value of k, where omega is the varying growth rate and k is our wave number. And these sinusoidal functions are only a limited number. So, I mean, only a limited number of these disturbances are actually unstable. So we will look at how these perturbations can be expressed in our functions in our Navier-Stokes equation. But before we talk more about these tiny disturbances, let's look at how the length scale is affected. So we can say that this length scale is the length over which the fluid turns into droplets. So at first, we have a very nice looking cylinder, but with the passage of time, the cylinder will eventually break up into these droplets, these tiny drops you see in the picture below. But there is going to be a certain length that we will call the critical length. So that is the length scale over which the fluid will begin to break up. But if you know the length scale and the jet speed, you will also be able to determine our time scale because time is simply length over speed. So now let's look deeper into the picture and check which values are important in determining our pi theorem. So we have five important factors. Number one, as I said, is our length scale. So although it could be kind of arbitrary, we will define this length this critical length before breakup as this critical length. And if you look at a fluid system, you have to also consider the certain factors like density, rho, and surface tension, gamma. But we will also consider this radius. Although this radius of the cylinder will become larger and larger with time after the perturbation effects take place, we can say that it's generally going to behave kind of constant until a certain amount of time passes. And also, we have to know this speed of the jet, which we will call u jet. And you might be wondering, well, we have this rho and gamma, but what about mu? What about our viscosity? But we will not be considering the viscous effects here in the Rayleigh plateau instability because if the viscous effects become dominant, we have to consider some other sort of parameter. But here we will see that this is the, these viscous effects are not as dominant. So we will only consider these five numbers, L, R, Rho, Gamma, and U, or U jet. And we will say that n, n is 5, okay? Let's scroll down a little and say that our n is 5. L and rho and r and u and gamma. So we know that L is just the dimension of L length, and rho, our density, is m, L to the power of minus 3, and r is also just L. Nu jet, it's meter per second, so it's going to be L times t to the minus 1, and gamma is going to be m times t to the minus 2. So it's dependent on mass and time. So we know these three, uh, these five n's, and we could probably predict that j, our j is going to be 3 because we have m, l, and t, and we do not have to consider the theta or the temperature effects. 
However, let's uh, take a deeper look by analyzing our matrix. So carrying on the matrix analysis, let's write for M, L, and T. So we write for L, L it's 0, 1, 0. And for a row, it's going to be since it's, since it's M times L to the minus 3, 1 minus 3, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 minus 1, 1, 0 minus 2. Therefore, we can say that our matrix will have, let's see. Well, if you looked at the first like matrix here, you could automatically see that, hey, this guy's determinant is actually going to be zero. Okay, so let's look at a different one. Let's look at this guy. Well, this guy, its determinant is going to be one times, well, one, one, zero, minus one. Okay, so that guy is like minus one, right? So that's not zero. Okay, so, hey, this guy's, this whole matrix's rank is going to be three, right? So our j, we can safely assume that this determinant, one of the determinants does not have a zero value, so our j is safely going to be 3, and our k, which is n minus j, is going to be 2. And as we know, k is the number of dimensionless pi's. Number of dimensionless pi's. Therefore, we can now write the equations for our two pi's. So which which variables do we want to select? Well, we can't select L, and we have to select three out of the other four guys. So I want to choose I want to choose R and row and let's see gamma. Okay, so let's first write an equation saying R to the A, row to the B, and gamma to the C times L critical, which gives our pi 1, and number 2, R to the A, rho to the B, gamma to the C, times U jet, which gives our pi 2. Actually, our first equation, we don't really have to do the Buckingham pi analysis because, well, we know that, well, R and L critical, they have, we both have the dimension L, right? Therefore, we can just, just say that, well, these guys are going to be related to one another. Like L critical over R is going to be our first constant pi 1. But if we just do a quick review of our Buckingham pi theorem, we can see that it is L times A, here as you see, and L M times like ML minus 3 times B, MT minus 2 times C, and L. These guys all have to sum up to a dimensionless pi, which will have m to the power of 0, l to the power of 0, and t to the power of 0. So if you add up the m's, it's going to be b plus c equals 0, and l a minus 3b plus 1 equals 0, t minus 3b minus 2c equals 0. So this will tell us a is minus 1, b is 0, c is 0, the obvious, obvious solution that L critical over R is dimensionless. Number two is more exciting and it gives us the information that we are really seeking. So R to the A, rho to the B, gamma to the C times U jet equals pi 1. If you do the same process, the same procedure, you will see M adds up to 0, L's adds up to 0, and T's adds up to 0. Therefore, we arrive at the conclusion that A is mine is 1 over 2 b is 1 over 2 and c is minus 1 over 2 which is equivalent to saying that our pi 2 is u times rho r over gamma to the power of 2 which is our pi 2 so we will say that of course pi 1 is a function of pi 2 so pi 1 is a function of pi 2 2. So what's a better way of saying this? Now that we know what pi 1 and pi 2 are, we can see that L critical over R is a function of who? U times rho R over gamma to the power of 1 over 2. Okay, we have this nice looking information, nice looking relationship, relation for the normalized critical link. And at the beginning, I told you 
the obvious fact that, well, time scale is length scale over jet speed, if you remember. So, therefore, we can define something called, what do we call it? The critical time, which is going to be well, length over speed, right? So this guy. So if you just do that, we are going to, hey, you see uh, our critical length here in you here. You could kind of switch up our r inside the brackets here and hey we get this new equation that will define our critical time as well rho r to the cube over gamma okay this turns into an equation uh we can like say that this is a kind of equation if we determine all the constants related but Let's simply just express our, or define our critical length scale to be this value without saying that it's a function, but it's a simple value of equation or equality. T critical is simply rho r cube over gamma to the power of 1 over 2. So we have this simple equation. But what does this equation tell us? Well, if you are, if we are, if or if I am not experienced, it is kind of difficult to determine the significance of this whole equation but we will first begin by uh, determining the things that we are familiar with so we know about the Reynolds number which is well rho v r and mu right these values are important but let's say that since mu is not important let's look at rho or in this case u and r you say that rho u and r are the values in our Reynolds number that determine our inertial energy. But if you look at this equation number one or equation number two, you will see that, well, rho u and r, these guys are just like in the Reynolds number on the top, on the numerator of the, the equation. So just like we did in the Reynolds number, we can say that this value at the top rho r u z are going to contribute to the inertial energy and it is clear that if the inertial energy sorry if the inertial energy increases the critical time will also increase or generally we can say that the critical length would increase this will make the stream less acceptable to instabilities generated by what we call these external disturbances but what about the denominator, our surface tension? Well, we saw that, okay, the numerator is kind of dependent on our inertial energy, so the denominator is dependent on the surface tension. But what actually does the increase of surface tension contribute to in our equation? Okay, we have to first look at our famous Young-Laplace equation to determine the importance of surface tension. Well, we have this complicated looking equation, delta P is gamma times the divergence of N, where N is the normal vector in the surface we are interested in. If we look at the case of an ellipsoid, just as a review, we see that these difficult looking divergence part can be expressed in simpler terms as one over R1, plus 1 over R2 when it's a kind of ellipsoid, so it's not a perfect sphere, but it has two different R values. But what about, what about these cylinder? We're interested in the cylinder, right? In the case of a cylinder, we have this fixed value of R1, but the R2 is going to infinite, so we do not have to consider R2, and delta P is simply gamma times 1 over r1. So if the surface tension increases, we can directly see that, oh, the delta p is going to be affected by the surface energy. But also we can, we can say that if the uh, perturbate, I mean, if the surface tension will increase, it will have a positive effect on the divergence of n we if this is not very intuitive you can think of a case with say 
and kind of flat looking drop and a higher looking one you can see that oh if you have a higher surface tension it's going to be it will going to act as a gain on this surface shape divergence and this will lead to the increase of the curvature which will also lead to the increase of the pressure gradient and this will lead to the pronounced pressure gradient which will lead to a higher momentum flux and by momentum flux we mean that we have a higher value of momentum flow from high pressure to low pressure because there is a high pressure gradient and what happens if we have a very high momentum flux well at the end it will turn into a droplet droplet that we want Basically, if we have a very high momentum flux, the pinched areas in the system will experience a sort of rupture, and when it ruptures, it will turn into or break up into droplets. We know this equation. Okay, surface tension increase leads to a positive gain in the divergence, which leads to the increase in the curvature, which leads to the increase in the pressure gradient, which increases the momentum flux, which leads to a droplet breakup and rupture. Okay, that's nice, but what, what else does this critical time equation tell us? Or how can we look at the same situation in terms of critical time? Well, let's see, let's see. In the case that we have no energy dissipation by stuff like mu, like viscosity, so if we do not have any viscous effects, if there is no presence of viscosity, we can simply see that, well, R rho T critical is a function of R and rho and gamma. And if we say that the inertial energy is constant, well, we can say that a lower critical time leads to a higher gamma and a higher critical time will lead to a very small gamma. But if we have a small critical time, total energy of the system will primarily be a function of this gamma, the surface tension. But in systems that have a very large critical time, in contrast, the low surface tension has to do more work. It has to work more in order to overcome the numerator part, which is our inertial energy, if it wants to change the shape of the jet to reduce the surface area. Therefore, we can say that it, since it takes more time, since you have to do more work, the process will take longer. And a longer process means that we have an increased critical time scale. Okay, so this is our interpretation in terms of energy. And how can we use this same information to actually design an engineering system? So in some applications, we want more droplets, and in some other applications, we do not want droplets. It's not always that droplet formation is always a good or bad thing when we want to design something, but sometimes we need more droplets. For example, in the case of an inkjet printer, right? If we don't have any droplets, it's not going to print anything, so... We need more droplets, but in other applications, for example, if you want to create a straight column of water or other liquids or liquid metals, you do not want them to turn into droplets, right? So if you do not, if you want droplets, if you look at this equation, what can you do as an engineer? Well, the most obvious thing that you could try is to increase the gamma the increase of surface energy where breakup is desirable. But if you do not want the system to break up, you can either, well, it would be easy as an engineer to increase the jet speed. So if you make a bit very fast jet, it's it would be less prone to turn into droplets. And if you have a very large R or the radius of the initial column, you could predict that it would be less prone to break up into droplets. Okay, that was cool. So what else can we do? Well, if you remember, we also talked about these tiny, teeny perturbations that are the cause of our 
distress of our Rayleigh plateau instability. So in terms of perturbations, if we look at it again, this uh, R, we will look at this R later, but this, if you look at this equation, uh, this, uh, if you look at the, we are going to talk about this more in the Navier-Stokes equation, but the disturbance due to this displacement due to the disturbance will take on the form of a wave equation, where r is proportional to exponential omega t plus i k x, where omega is the growth rate and k is the wave number. So for the increase in perturbation is going to lead to an increase in the divergence of n. It is going to also lead to curvature increase and pressure gradient increase and the increase of momentum flux from high pressure to low pressure, which will eventually lead to droplet formation. Now let's look at the perturbations in respect in terms of the Buckingham Pi theorem. Okay, we said that R is a function of omega, rho, gamma, and k, where k is the wave number and omega is the growth rate. So what does this tell us? Well, if you do the same J rank analysis for M, L, and T, we see that R is 0, 1, 0, omega is 0, 0, minus 1, rho is 1, minus 3, 0, gamma is 1, 0, minus 2, and k is 0, minus 1, and 0. Okay, let's check if our determinant is, our rank is 3 or not. So I predict our rank is 3 because we have these 3 m's and l's and t's and we do not have our theta. So we can predict that j is smaller than 3, but if you try our rank for this matrix, it is going to be well, 1 times 1, 0, 0, minus 1, which is again minus 1, which is not 0. Okay, yay, we know for sure that j is 3. Okay, so now let's see. Our n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and our j is 3. So, okay, k is again 2. And we know intuitively that, well, we have our r, which is the dimension of l, and k, which is the dimension of l to the minus 1 since it's wave number. We can automatically say that, well, our one of our pi's, 1 pi, can be expressed as kr. But if you do our Buckingham pi analysis in the boring or orthodox way, we will come up with these two equations. Okay, I said omega. Let's choose, well, let's choose omega and rho and gamma. Okay, omega and rho and gamma as our three scaling variables or our three repeating variables. So omega times a. Gamma, oh, I rho times b and gamma times c times r is going to be our pi 1 and our pi 2 is going to be the same process but we will replace our r with k. So if you solve all these boring long lengthy equations you will lead to the tedious equation that pi 1 is rho uh, omega square over gamma to the power of 1 over 3 times r and pi 2 is gamma over rho and omega squared to the power of 1 over 3 times k. Oh, but we don't want these two pi's, right? You don't want something that looks complicated like this. We want something simpler, like kr. So let's multiply these two pi's, pi 1 times pi 2, which is going to be our desired kr. And we don't want something like 1 over 3 to the power, right? So we are going to take the cube of pi 1, which will become rho times r cube times omega square over gamma. Okay, we want to determine the relationship, the function between these two dimensionless pi's. Therefore, we can say that rho r cube omega square over gamma okay over gamma is a function of who a function of kr but hey we know who this guy is no i don't well you do because this guy looks familiar this 
Ro R and Gamma Guy. This guy looks kind of familiar, right? Right. We just said that T critical. T critical, you remember? So we defined this to be Rho R cube over gamma to the power of 1 over 2. And if you don't believe me, you could go straight up and see, okay, hey, we see this equation here. Okay, it's confirmed that T critical can be expressed like this. So you go down and plug this guy in and we come up with a magical equation that this equals omega squared times T critical square and this was only the introduction to the specific function which we call the dispersion relation and if we know these the nature or if we can determine the nature of instability formation using the properties the various properties like surface tension or r which eventually leads to the cross-sectional area or also the growth rate of the disturbance like omega which is which has a dependence on the wavelength itself we will talk more about how this relationship is going to be expressed in a more quantitative or mathematical way using the navier stokes equation in our next section